thank you for having me today. Uh, thank you. The thank uh, I thank the Net Institute for funding this project. Uh, so this project will be about strategic investment in the broadband industry. Uh, so this paper is motivated by two observations. Uh, so the first observation has to do with the state of the U.S. broadband industry, uh, where the technology that offers uh, uh, the highest uh, speeds and the largest bandwidth, the optical fiber, seems to have diffused really uh, slowly, especially after 2006. So this graph shows that the, the largest share of new broadband subscriptions uh, in the U.S. were absorbed by the technology that offers uh, slightly inferior uh, speeds, cable broadband. In addition, we can see uh, cable firms, cable incumbents, have persistent large uh, market shares in the industry. The second observation has to do with how these cable incumbents uh, respond when there is a fiber entry threat. Uh, so this news article refer uh, to Time Warner uh, investment and quality offering uh, in markets where Google Fiber uh, was really close on entering. Uh, I mean, I live in Durham and C. Uh, suddenly, AT&T Fiber announced that it will enter Durham, and then a month later, I started receiving uh, an offering from Time Warner for 20 times higher speed than before. Of course, uh, cable firms may claim that they adopt, they offer, they start offering higher speeds in markets where uh, demand is higher. But at the same time, we see that in markets that there is no fiber entry threat. It seems that they uh, offer higher speeds much later. Uh, so the, the idea of this paper, uh, so this paper contributes to the literature of strategic investment. There is a very large theoretical literature on the topic, but very limited empirical uh, work. I mean, the reason for this is because it's really hard uh, to distinguish between uh, incumbents trying to deter entry or adapting for competitive regions. Uh, so the key research question of this paper is do uh, incumbents strategically adopt uh, a new technology to deter entry or do they just adapt because of higher demand or do they just want to prepare themselves for a post-entry competition. So uh, the application will be the US broadband industry, uh, the wireless broadband industry. Uh, it will be a game of cable incumbents vs potential fiber entrants. Uh, and fiber, en fiber entry can be deterred by many, by other reasons like low demand or legal uh, barriers that are fairly exogenous. And the question is, can they actually be deterred by cable investment? Uh, it's really important to know why cable internet providers adopt, uh, invest. There are very different implications for market structure and optimal subsidy policy. If uh, cable incumbents just invest to prepare themselves for a post-entry world, then consumers are actually better because entry is not deterred, fiber firms enter, consumers receive higher equilibrium quality in the market. On the other hand, if cable incumbents adapt to deter, that means that in the short run consumers receive higher speeds, but uh, in the long run, there is a lower uh, equilibrium quality in the market. And at, and at the same time, since the, this industry uh, exhibits uh, many policy challenges, uh, for example, subsidy, it's good to know uh, whether funding one of these type of firms will have any deterrent effects on the other type of firm. So the empirical strategy I'm following in this uh, the empirical strategy that I'm following in this uh, paper is that I observe a variation of cable investment and fiber entry, uh, and I use an exogenous uh, uh, entry thread to identify all these effects. Uh, so there are three main uh, wireland technologies in this industry. Uh, so uh, DSL, which um, Kyle described it, described the technologies before, but let me focus on DOCSIS 3.0, which is the largest technological uh, innovation uh, difference of quality in the cable broadband. Uh, it can offer 10 times higher speeds than the previous uh, DOCSIS system. Uh, and it involves investment of the bulk one uh, network plus the network modem. And then uh, the optical fiber firms, uh, it, the, what they use the, the fiber to the home network, uh, 
and they use uh, they, they can enter in uh, in their set of potential markets. We'll I'll explain later. Fixed costs are, are pretty small in this industry, uh, and the cable adaptation and fiber entry costs differ, which gives a strategic advancement uh, advantage for uh, the cable companies. At the same time, investment in these networks is irreversible. In the sense that if cable firms uh, adopt a new si a system, that makes it a credible mechanism in the case of fiber entry. Uh, so the product space here will be the Warland broadband. Uh, the, the, the geographical space uh, will be a census block group. So uh, a, market, a market needs to satisfy two conditions uh, for, a, for a relative market uh, definition. So you need to have the same set of competitors in each market and cons comp uh, consumers need to face uh, the same set of products. At the same time, many decisions uh, like uh, subsidy policies occur uh, at the most local level, even at the household level. And at the same time, I, I, we still observe variation of firm choices within sales tracks and counties. Uh, the cable decision here will be whether to switch to the new DOCSIS 3.0 system, uh, and the fiber firm will make the decision whether to enter. Uh, the potential entry definition that I'm using here uh, is uh, exogenous and it consists of uh, various city uh, provider agreements or whether a fiber firm already offers a DSL in a, in a market or whether it has announced that will enter in a market. Also the definition of market size here uh, is a combination of population density of household income and number of DSL firms which were, uh, work as an indicator of how high demand is. The data that I'm using uh, is, the first is the national broadband map. Uh, it consists, it's, it's has been constructed by the FCC, the National Telecom Association. Uh, I focus on New York State uh, for the years 2011-2013, every six months. Uh, I observe cable uh, and fiber firms uh, making technology adoption and entry decisions. Uh, an advantage of this data is that you can observe firms decision at the most local level the disadvantage is that this data set, at least for now, doesn't include price data or subscri subscriber data. Uh, I uh, compiled data for the five main potential fiber firms uh, by using information on uh, whether they are regional or municipal uh, fiber firms, whether they offer a DSL uh, in an area, and whether they have license agreements with cities. The benefit of this is that it provides an exogenous variation of uh, which firms are potential fiber entrants. Uh, a disadvantage, of course, is that there is not much uh, time variation. At the same time, this is uh, also an advantage because it's very exogenous in, uh, very exogenous in my data. And I combined uh, market level data uh, uh, from uh, US Census population and aggregate income, which I receive uh, population density. So how DOCSIS 3.0 has evolved? Um, a very big part of these markets before 2011 already occurred. I mean, this is a disadvantage that we cannot deal with because the data set started after 2010 and 2011. Uh, but there is still movement, right? So one third of uh, markets still uh, have um, face uh, experience uh, cable adoption. At the same time, in the beginning of period, 26% uh, of markets, of total markets, had optical fiber provider, and then in the end, uh, that was 34%. Uh, so first, the first, uh, the first evidence here of uh, strategic cable adoption is, first of all, the question is whether a cable provider can actually adapt and affect fiber decision, right? So the first is, uh, can actually be deterred if they decide to adopt a DOCS 3.0, right? So this, this table here uses markets where Time Warner is a dominant player. Uh, and I model the decision of five potential ent fiber entrants. And the important coefficient here is Time Warner effect. Uh, so this, for all specifications, that means that it reduces uh, fiber entry by 2%. Since the mean uh, probability of entry here is only 9%, that means that uh, cable incumbents can actually, if they, ad if they adopt the new system, can actually really deter uh, fiber entry significantly. The second uh, set of evidence of, strat of strategic adoption uh, has to do with whether you are in a market, first of all, that um, 
has, there is an entry thread, right? So the first column of this table, I run a logit specification. Uh, the entry thread here is a dummy zero one in whether Time Warner is in a market that has at least one potential entrant, right? So this variable here is completely exogenous on the number of uh, potential entrants. In markets that there is uh, entry thread, this, uh, this means that if there is a 36% higher probability that the cable, that time owner will adapt to the, to the, to the new system, will, will switch to the new system. The second set of evidence, uh, I uh, take a predicted value of, of entry, uh, of fiber entry on, uh, uh, on the set of, on the exogenous set of potential markets, uh, and I include it in the cable adoption decision. So this argument uh, is that uh, if, we, if there is a deterrence in this, uh, in this industry, you should observe that suddenly in the intermediate markets, uh, the time owner should adapt more than in the small markets where entry can be deterred by demand, or large markets like New York City that fiber entry will occur in any case. Uh, so I use, I took this, uh, I'm, I'm motivated by the previous evidence and I built a model uh, of uh, technology adoption and, strat and stra uh, st strategic entry deterrence. Uh, it's a, I, I built in a sequential model here. There are two firms in each market, a cable incumbent and a potential fiber entrant. Um, the investment here takes the form of technology adoption. Uh, the choices are discrete. Uh, and once what that's an entrant builds, it knows where it becomes an entrant. Uh, I use a reduced form uh, uh, profit function uh, where the first three parts are determinants of uh, demand in the industry, uh, like the number, uh, or the, like the population density, uh, aggregate income, the number of DSL. Uh, and there is this coefficient in the private, in the, in the fiber entrant decision on whether uh, the theta FC, on whether uh, you enter in a market that has a DOCSIS 3.0. And of course, both firms pay an adoption cost or entry cost. Uh, so the sequential game in the stage one, cable incumbent decides whether to adapt. Stage two, uh, uh, the fiber uh, firm observes cable adoption decision and draws socks and profits are determined. So this is a sequential. Uh, game of incomplete information in the sense that cable uh, move first and they don't uh, and they form expectations about these error terms. Uh, the probability that the potential I, I solve the model backwards, so the, we start in stage two uh, before the entry decision. The probability that potential entrant will choose to enter is uh, since I assume logit errors is a reduced for uh, is a, a closed form solution. Uh, which determines it's a function, it's conditional on a cable adoption decision. Uh, so there are two probabilities, uh, separate uh, entry probabilities, depending on what, whether uh, cable uh, incumbent has adopted or not. So fiber firm here decides to enter in this exogenous set of potential markets. Uh, so this probability, uh, this uh, reaction function of uh, fiber entry, of, of the fiber, of potential fiber entrant gets in the first stage where the cable incumbent now has this deterrence effect. Uh, since the, the incumbent needs to think about what this adoption decision effect will have on the fiber uh, entry likelihood. Uh, if this is positive, that will lead to overinvestment in the industry. Um, if it's not, if there is no deterrence effect, then we will just see uh, the one that we would, should expect if there was no fiber entry. And then the reaction function of the cable firm uh, takes into account its, uh, its own decision on whether the fiber entry will enter conditional on its own decision. So I solve this game. Uh, this requires a fixed point for probability of cable adoption and fiber entry. This is the coefficients that I take. The good news is that there is a negative effect of uh, cable adoption on uh, fiber entry decision. Um, and then I use the structural parameters to perform counterfactuals. So the first counterfactual is, uh, I mean, there is a discussion of how I solve this. Uh, 
so that deterrence effect will be zero that I sold. Uh, I solve for equilibrium as a, as a deviation from this optimal strategy. Uh, so I find that in the case that we remove the terms, there should be 16% uh, less markets with cable adoption, a significantly uh, higher fiber entry. So that means that actually cable firms choose to overinvest uh, to deter fiber entry. So someone can say, OK, so why, so why is that bad news? Uh, this is bad news in the sense that uh, in the perfect scenario that we could pre-commit cable incumbents uh, not to deter entry, but just to prepare themselves for competitive reasons, we should observe much significant, much significant fiber entry. Uh, the second counterfactual that I examine is, well, let's say that we subsidize these providers uh, in markets that uh, they actually don't have broadband or have a really slow broadband. So this is uh, the New York State uses a definition of small markets of uh, the 10% of the markets that are considered small. So this kind of factor is really important because it means that if we subsidize cable firms in these markets, that actually may lead to significantly less fiber entry in the sense that uh, the policymaker here may subsidize these deterrent strategies. On the other hand, if fiber firms uh, are subsidized, that means that the cable adoption doesn't change. The intuition for this is that cable in incumbents consider fiber likelihood very possible, so they don't bother actually to deter. And the, the third counterfactual is that there are many states, uh, like for example Texas, uh, that allow a license, a state license, for a broadband provider uh, to enter anywhere in the state. Uh, New York State has uh, various uh, local uh, legal barriers that do not allow this. So the idea is that suppose that we give a license for all these five potential entrants to enter anywhere in the state. And now we see that this is a mechanism actually to keep cable adoption lower than the previous situation and significantly have a uh, higher uh, fiber entry. Um, so this mechanism, for example, of, of like a subsidy to small markets work as a pre-commitment for fiber firms in the sense that if Google Fiber says that I will enter uh, no matter what Time Warner does, this actually makes Time Warner uh, to bind to a non-deterring strategy. So why this paper is important? <laughs> um, so it's really important, as I said, to know why firms invest. Uh, we know a lot about competitive effects, uh, I mean, much less in broadband. But it's really important how this strategic investment affects market outcomes and how this affects uh, whether co consumers will receive uh, better quality products. Um, there is a very big discussion of how we can use pre-committed mechanisms uh, to affect these decisions and how and where the policy market should subsidize and where. Uh, as I saw in this paper, providing a statewide a license is probably a better way uh, to promote uh, higher speeds than subsidies. And of course, the, the role of the local entry buyers, uh, as I mentioned. Um, there are many venues that I'm thinking about this paper. One of these is how this uh, deterrent strategies affect the evolution of related industries, uh, like online video, especially in the beginning of online video. Another future uh, work based on these ideas um, is whether this cable adaption can work as a signaling mechanism, for example, that or no adaption as a signaling of, of, of low demand for cable incumbents. Kyle Wilson will be uh, our discussant, and please give him the mic. Thank you. OK, so uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to, to read and discuss this paper. Um, I think Teddy did a, a really wonderful job on this, on this topic. Um, so let me try to summarize briefly what, you know, what I think it is that, that he set out to do and what he's accomplished in this paper. Um, <clears throat> So Teddy's main research question here was, do in incumbent cable firms make strategic investments in order to deter fiber firms from entering the market? 
right? He's looking at this in the context of the broadband industry, um, you know, but this is a strategic effect that we, we might think would take place in other industries as well. Um, and so what, is, what, he said, what does he actually you know, go ahead and do in this paper? Um, I think he proceeds through this in a, in a really nice logical order. So first he provides us with some reduced form evidence uh, that when cable firms make investments, it actually does reduce the probability of fiber entry. Right? This is sort of a, a necessary condition we would need to observe um, in order to think that, that cable firms are actually using this deterrent strategy. And he does find evidence that this is the case. <clears throat> Second, he, he provides us with some reduced form evidence uh, that cable incumbents are more likely to invest when they're threatened by fiber entry. Okay, this is, again, evidence that, um, that they're actually using this strategy in order to accomplish bullet point one of, of reducing fiber entry. Um, and then in his results, he finds this inverted U-shape in the probability of, of entry, um, which is predicted by this Ellison and Ellison paper um, as, as a, a condition under which we would believe that preemption is taking place. Um, third, he, he constructs a, a structural model um, where we have cable incumbents making investments and potential fiber entrants entering the market. And he uses, he estimates this model and he identifies the determinants of profits and the sunk costs associated with those actions. And then he uses this model to simulate counterfactuals, um, the one that that, that is most salient, I think, here that gets at this, this research question is where he removes any possibility of a deterrence effect. Um, and he finds that when you take that possibility away, there's a 16% drop in the cable investment rate. Okay, so when they can't deter, they invest less, which gives us evidence that, uh, that they are using a deterrence strategy. Um, so here's where I think Teddy is making some very nice contributions to the literature. Um, you know, so a really important question in the industrial organization literature is what strategies are firms using to deter entry and maintain market power? Um, so if we look at you know, John Terrell's seminal textbook, um, he devotes 57 pages to discussion of this. Um, it's, the, it's the longest chapter in the whole book. Right? So this, this is an important question to us in the field. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of theoretical literature. Uh, all these papers here I've cited are, are just some examples of the theori theoretical literature on the topic. Um, but there's still fairly limited empirical literature. There are a number of papers that have, um, that have done this. Um, <clears throat> you know, some of them are, are named here. But I think Teddy's making a very nice contribution um, through analyzing um, preemption in broadband. Secondly, I think this is a topic that has big implications for policy. Right? Broadband policy is a big issue right now. Um, and it's important that we understand the industry as well as we can in order to think best about what kind of policies are optimal, right? Um, if we're finding evidence that there's anti-competitive behavior going on, which, which Teddy does, um, this informs us about what kind of policies we might want to take, such as removing barriers to entry and efficient subsidy policies. Um, so now let me just provide a couple of comments that I have about the paper, <clears throat> perhaps some suggestions as well. Um, so one thing that I, I think um, we want to think about here is when we see that cable incumbents are investing more in response to entry threat, we should ask what else might be causing that investment besides this entry threat. So the, the LOGIT specification that Teddy uses is the one I, I've listed here, where that key right-hand side variable is this dummy for entry threat. Um, and something I wonder is whether there might be other market characteristics um, that are leading this market to be a high demand market, one which would demand fast internet speeds. And that's inducing fiber firms to gain licenses um, you know, to provide fiber there, but also inducing cable firms to provide faster speeds. Um, and if that's the case, um, then, then we might want to think about some solutions for, for dealing with it. So a couple of them. Um, you know, this first one is just a, another way, I think, to provide some, some evidence that the effect that you're picking up is, is is what you want to say it is. Um, and so another specification you can run in addition to this one would be to regress cable investment on not the threat of entry, but the actual observed entry. Um, now, I don't know what coefficient you'll get out of this, but imagine, for instance, that you get a smaller coefficient on that regression than the one that you've currently run. Then what this is saying is that uh, when there's a threat of entry, cable firms invest, but when they actually when there's actually realized entry, that's not so much inducing them to invest. Right? So this suggests that the preemption effect is quite real, because they're investing when it's not too late to do something about it. Um, 
you know, so, so I think if you find that effect, that helps sell your story a lot. If you don't find that effect, I don't think it hurts you at all. So it's, I think, costless to do this, um, but it might be worth a shot. Um, a second possible solution here, um, something I'm going to suggest is actually just a slight modification to something that Teddy's already doing. So he runs the second specification where on the right-hand side we have a predicted probability of fiber entry and a quadratic term for that, um, which I think is a really nice way to go about this. Um, it's sort of, sort of like a two-stage least squares approach where you're looking for exogenous variation to predict fiber entry. Um, but I think it would be worthwhile um, to, to try and add a variable into that first stage that's both exogenous and excluded as far as the cable investment decision is concerned. So something more than market characteristics. Um, one thing that you might think about using would be the distance or the proximity of a market to um, a market that had fiber back in 2010. Right? To the extent that there's economies of scale and these fiber firms can expand cheaply outwards, um, that might be a cost shifter for fiber firms that doesn't affect cable firms. Um, so you, I don't know if that's the right sort of instrument, but you might think about something along those lines. Um, second comment that, that I have here is just, um, I think it's worth asking if this is the right set of firms and markets to use. Um, so the first, the first question on this point is, um, you know, is the analysis sensitive to using only Time Warner as the incumbent? So I know that they're the major player in, in New York. Um, so definitely they're going to be the incumbent in most of these markets. Um, but it would be worth knowing whether this deterrence of behavior is applied by other firms as well. And if you find that it is, then I think you have an even bigger story here, um, you know, which, which says that this is a widespread effect. Um, the second question on this point is, should we think of DSL firms as strategic players as well? So in the structural model, I know that you're, you're modeling cable incumbents versus fiber entrants, um, but Verizon, you know, a DSL player, is, is the, the largest fiber provider. So I'm not sure if it might be more appropriate to think of, of them as sort of like this cable firm that can become a fiber, or a DSL firm that can become a fiber firm. Um, it seems like they have a strategic role here as well. Um, and then lastly, this is just a question on the, the, the markets that you're including. Um, so it seems, in my reading at least, that, that because you had this second stage in the game where there's fiber entry, that means you're using markets that have the possibility of fiber entry. Um, but I think you could get useful variation from including markets that have no potential fiber entrance in the structural model. Um, because now we can observe whether cable incumbents are behaving differently in those markets where they can't possibly preempt anyone. Um, and my last comment, I think, is actually just some really minor points um, on the interpretation of the parameter estimates. Um, so one thing that I wonder is, you estimate this cable adoption cost, and I wonder whether it's separately identified from a change in variable profits. We might think that when cable firms adopt this new DOCSIS, um, they might see an increase in revenues along with it. Um, I don't think this is a problem. I don't think it's important, um, but I think it would be worth um, just figuring out whether they're separately identified or not. Um, and then secondly, um, thinking about what the scale of the estimated parameters is. I don't think that they're like automatically in dollar terms, but there might be like a nice normalization that you can make just like by dividing through by adoption costs or something to give us sort of a scale to think about you know, what a six is versus a, a two or, or something like that. Um, so let me wrap up. Um, I think Teddy has a really wonderful paper on his hands here, and I think it's making some important contributions. Um, namely, he, he's giving us evidence that cable incumbents do respond to the threat of fiber entry by making strategic investments. And secondly, he's showing us that those efforts are successful, that after they make those strategic investments, fiber firms are, are deterred from entering. Um, and so I think he's making a nice contribution to the empirical literature on entry deterrence. And again, I want to stress that I think this is really important to our, our understanding of public policy as we set out to design policies um, that that in, improve consumer welfare um, by opening up markets to entry and protecting us against perhaps some uh, anti-competitive behaviors. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, can we pass the mic to? Oh, of course. Uh, I think Kyle for very nice comments. Uh, I want to address two big issues uh, from Kyle's comments. Uh, so the first has to do about the um, fiber uh, entry thread VS observe uh, entry. Um, 
so we want so why I'm using uh, entry thread is because this is a more powerful measure of uh, on cable adoption than actually observed entry thread. Oh, sorry, observed entry in the sense that you can observe uh, uh, cable incumbents how they react in, um, in the case that there is not actually fiber entry. I mean, that, this is why we use a structural model is because we want to actually see what will be like the, the structural model if there is entry thread, but there is no actual entry, right? So in the, in the counterfactuals, then we can see what will be the observed entry in, if we remove these buyers that I mentioned. Uh, the second comment uh, was about the exogeneity of fiber entry. So this, uh, this, the second data set that I presented about how potential uh, entrants vary across markets gives this exogenous variation and doesn't uh, change like for years, like for a decade. It's really hard for fiber firms to actually negotiate with local authorities to actually get an extra. Uh, so this varies fiber entry decision, uh, but get not cable adoption, right? So I focus on, so I take how uh, cable uh, firms react to this entry threat when there is actually no way that there will be fiber entry in this markets vs the other markets. Um, I don't know, I, I think that I, yeah, I don't think I have, uh, yeah. I think this is the most important. I mean, I would love to discuss it later with you. I think this is the most important things that I want to discuss. Questions? Uh, great, uh, great paper. Um, I read your paper too. Um, uh, just one question on strategic entry. I realized, uh, so with fiber entry, I think the models that I've seen, both municipal fiber, Google fiber, and any others, there's always strategic entry. They don't roll out to the entire city. Uh, in the case of Google, you know, uh, there are the fiber hoods. Whereas with cable upgrades, and I'm with Comcast, um, cable upgrades, DOCS is 3.0, uh, which is upgraded fully. That's upgraded across the footprint. You start off in certain areas. I mean, in the case of Comcast, uh, and the entire network is upgraded to 3.0, and it started like around 2008 and was completed within two years or two and a half years. So I see when you're looking at sort of strategic uh, decisions in terms of where you begin, but uh, because the network, the difference between cable and, and fiber is that the, the network that is used for providing broadband is also the network that is used for providing video, and video is subject to franchising agreements. So, you know, you upgrade, and we have a policy of upgrading to the entire footprint with 3.0. So I didn't quite understand. Did you factor that in? Because you know you may start off initially, but within pretty much a year or two years, at the most three years, it's available across the footprint, whether a fiber is there or not. Uh, which seems to me to think that you know that might end up changing your model in terms of. Um, whereas you know if 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 upgrades were occurring in only in those areas, then I can see your point. Right. Uh, so I started my talk with uh, anecdotal evidence uh, from a news article. So when Google Fiber said that they will enter, uh, I don't remember the city I, um, that I mentioned. Uh, so Time Warner decided to, uh, to, uh, to upgrade uh, in markets where Google Fiber suggested that will enter, like in the city. But Google Fiber didn't actually enter in all these markets. So the fact that there is this potential entry threat uh, gives a variation to cable uh, investment in markets that Google Fiber was a potential entrant or not. The second argument is that uh, it matters when deci you decide to adapt. So cable firms do not adapt like the same, as you said, the same, the, the, the DOCS is 3.0 in all markets. So the, the, the fact that they choose to adapt in some markets before other markets or in markets that are intermediate and not only New York City that gives a variation of this that I'm using in the data set. So I'm using variation of these potential entrants across, uh, across, the market, across the markets. And I saw that it's not necessarily true that they will adapt in this high demand Manhattan markets, for example, but they may choose in markets that there is entry threat. So there is another deviation, right? So eventually, the majority of markets, it's true that they adapt, but there is still this the timing of where or where or when you will decide to adopt is not actually true. And also, 
Docs is two zero, uh, three zero. Uh, I mean, it's still, it's not the full. The U.S. hasn't fully adopted the new system. I mean, the next system is three one, right? Docs is three one, but still in three zero, there is still movement that's going on. So I mean, this is uh, in New York State, for example, it happens that it adopted uh, throughout 2015, 2014, but in the rest of the country, they're still rolling out of Docs 3.0. But yeah, I mean, but there is variation that I'm using here. Yeah. Hi, uh, ni nice paper, um, just like the first one. Um, quick uh, comment here. So um, your counterfactual one was removing strategic actions, or, or, just, or but so counterfactual one, sh for whatever we want to call it, showed the drop, yeah, drop in cable adoption, increase in fiber adoption, increase in fiber wasn't quite as much as the drop in cable. It would be nice to put dollar figures on this to see like net net, whether there'd be increased investment, and I don't know where you'd get those figures, perhaps from Kyle's paper, right? Or, or, or industry sources or something like that. So the reason I raise this is that over the last couple of years, something that um, some economists have pointed out is that there's been a drop in aggregate investment in this space, and people have attributed that to regulations that the current administration has been putting in place. Your paper provides a counter argument, which is that it has nothing to do with regulations or not. It's all about uh, sort of strategic investment. And, and so it'd just be sort of a nice way to sort of position this in a, in a, for, for a slightly different audience, if you will. Right. Uh, I think that it's, more, it's not the one or the other. Uh, so there are different reasons why it may deter it, right? So as I, as I mentioned, in the, both in the data set that I'm using about the potential fiber entrance and in the counterfactual, uh, I consider this as complementary, so that you don't have a license to enter in a market and also d demand may be low, or cable. Uh, what's interesting about cable in in investment here is that something that you can actually do as a cable incumbent to actually deter, right? So it's not something completely exogenous, I mean, fairly exogenous. Uh, but th there is something that you can, ac I can actually do to deter. So, that's, so I would say that's more complementary, but I, I completely agree with you, I mean, yeah. All right, thank you very much.